Hello everyone, welcome back. This is Matthews, PhD student of philosophy from Brazil. And today I'm going to talk about Bertrand Russell's view on Christianity, based on his famous lecture, Why I'm Not a Christian, where he writes that he finds Christianity to be a doctrine of cruelty, and even states that Christianity and religion in general delays moral progress. So we are going to look at all his arguments throughout the text and how he addresses the famous arguments in favor of God's existence, some of them, although not all of them, and I'm going to tell you my own views on the matter. <music> So if you don't know Bertrand Russell, he is a figure that gave a great contribution to modern logic and mathematics and also a famous commentator of the history of philosophy. He has a, a great three-volume work entitled History of Occidental Philosophy and he finds that, for example, the medieval philosophy Uh, scholastics, for instance, is a uh, dishonest philosophy because it lacks the critical thinking, right? Thomas Aquinas already uh, presupposes that which he tries to prove, which is God. And uh, when you submit yourself as a philosopher to a revealed truth from faith, Russell sees it as somewhat dishonest and uh, a source of damage to the intellectual thinking. And he's also someone who was very famous for trying to make uh, philosophy, uh, make the basis of philosophy the field of logic. Uh, as Wittgenstein, as Alfred Whitehead, J. Moore, he was an analytic philosopher. The analytical philosophy is uh, a split that happened uh, between the, the, the different fields of philosophy. The British uh, philosophers, like Russell himself, saw continental philosophy, that philosophy that happened uh, in other countries of Europe, like uh, Germany, for example, the philosophies of Friedrich Nietzsche, Arthur Schopenhauer as somewhat uh, lacking uh, a, a more uh, rigorous method, methodology and, and logic. And, uh, th and they decided to make themselves stand out from these other philosophers. But Russell is also a very secular guy, as you can tell. He was someone who criticized the monarchy and also uh, a, a, a very interested uh, commentator of great philosophical problems like free will or causality. He has a, a great article on, on the notion of cause, uh, which is from 1912 and another from 1914, uh, where he also addresses free will, uh, where, where he addresses the criticism of causality made by Hume, David Hume, and he tries to develop the same criticism a little bit further in logical grounds. But today we're going to talk about his views on Christianity. So he starts saying that in other epochs it was uh, somewhat clearer what one person meant when he said he was a Christian. Nowadays, back in his time, a hundred years ago, and also today, it is not as clear, he states. I think, however, that there are two different items which are quite essential to anybody calling himself a Christian. The first one is a dogmatic, of a dogmatic nature, namely, that you must believe in God and immortality. If you do not believe in those two things, I do not think that you can properly call yourself a Christian. Then, further than that, as the name implies, you must have some kind of belief about Christ. 
it's reasonable to assume that you should believe that Christ is God or he has some su supernatural origin. If you don't, it's hard to, to argue that you are a Christian, even if you follow his teachings. Moving on, he addresses the arguments for God's existence. And he starts by the first cause argument, which is actually the, the second argument that Aquinas presents uh, to, to support his defense of God's existence. It is an ontological argument, which is very similar to the argument from movement, which is also uh, predicated on a first uh, motor. Uh, in the same way, the first cause argument is predicated on a first cause. So the first cause for the universe for all the contingency, the contingent beings uh, would have to be God, an absolute. This goes back to Aristotle's metaphysics. This is no surprise, and it is flawed, according to Russell. He says, there is no reason to suppose that the world had a beginning at all. The idea that things must have a beginning is really due to the poverty of our imagination. Therefore, perhaps, I need not waste any more time upon the argument about the first cause. So, uh, following this argument, he presents the natural law argument. He writes, The whole idea that natural law imply a lawgiver is due to a confusion between natural and human laws. Human laws are, are behests commanding you to behave a certain way, in which you may choose to behave, or you may choose not to behave. But natural laws are a description of how things do in fact behave. And being a mere description of what they in fact do, you cannot argue that there must be somebody who told them to do that. Because even... Supposing that there were, you are then faced with the question, why did God issue just those natural laws and not others, and no others? If you say that he did it simply from his own good pleasure and without any reason, you then find that there is something which is not subject to law, and so your train of natural law is, interrupt, is interrupted. If you say as more orthodox theologians do, that in all the laws which God issues, he had a reason for giving those laws rather than others, the reason, of course, being to create the best universe, although you would never think it to look at it. If there were a reason for the laws which God gave, then God himself was subject to law, and therefore you do not get any advantage by introducing God as an intermediary. You really have a law outside and interior to divine edict, and God does not serve your purpose, because he is not the ultimate lawgiver. This is a very reasonable counter-argument. If something is anterior, if something precedes God, then God is not the absolute, which uh, the, the writings, the, the, the sacred writings of Christianity, claim he is. Now we go to the argument from design, which is actually the fifth argument by Aquinas and the most popular between among uh, uh, theologians and Christian scientists of the 21st century. So the universe is marvelous. It has just a precise equilibrium, a balance which makes us think that it has to be some kind of art form, not an art form, but some kind of artifact, some kind of creative achievement from an intelligent creator. But you can also look at this by the God delusion by Dawkins, where we can understand that because nature looks as though it was created, 
It looks as though it has design purpose, elegancy. It does not mean there was indeed someone behind it as some sort of project, right? It does not mean a designer. So Russell says, Do you think that if you were granted omnipotence and omniscience and millions of years in which to perfect your world, you could produce nothing better than the Ku Klux Klan or the fascists? Moreover, if you accept the ordinary laws of science, you have to suppose that human life and life in general on this planet will die out in due course. It is a stage in the decay of the solar system. At a certain stage of decay, you get the sort of conditions of temperature and so forth which are suitable to protoplasm and there is life for a short time in the life of the whole solar system. You see in the moon the sort of thing to which the earth is standing, something dead, cold, and lifeless. You can also look at the Milky Way and the solar system, our solar system in particular, and see that earth is not the center, earth is not really that important. It's actually small and more like a, a periphery, and so... Why would God be so interested in, in such primates uh, do such thing and not put uh, Earth as the center of the, solar, of the solar system? Or at least a more uh, outstanding planet from, uh, uh, from a, a geometrical perspective or, or astronomical perspective. It's, it's much more reasonable to suppose that Earth is just another planet. There may be other planets, Earth-like planets, with life in it in other systems, which we may never, unfortunately, meet. But there probably are aliens in that sense. Now, this is very interesting. He goes on to address the moral arguments. And uh, he talks a lot about Immanuel Kant which was uh, someone that rejected scholastics, rejected Descartes, and argued that the world in itself is something we will never really uh, be able to encapsulate by our cognitive faculties. I don't know the term you use in English. Uh, here we, t we call it the transcendental subject. The transcendental subject is every human being. We perceive the world with categories like time and space, and this is our way of perceiving the world, according to Kant. And therefore, objects like God, immortality, soul, eternity, these are metaphysical objects, and metaphysics is out of the scope of human science. So we can never, he, he was trying to do as someone from the Enlightenment, he was trying to make philosophy into a science. And, and so he criticizes the, the arguments in favor of God's existence. But nevertheless, he ends up creating a new argument, which is a moral argument. In the, the second critique, which is the practical reason critique. Uh, so for Kant, there has to be a God in order for uh, morality be possible, in order for right and wrong to exist. And so Kantians today argue about that. This is not an orthodox, an orthodox reading of Kant. Some people say that this is just uh, regulatory, you, you know, you cannot... Uh, say that Kant uh, believe that there, there has to be a belief in God uh, in itself, or at least that we have to assume right and wrong as absolutes. Only that. Um, well, Russell seems to think that Kant really did uh, defend the, the necessity of a, a belief in God in order for morality. 
and morality exists, so there must be a God. Well, Russell goes on to criticize this argument, stating the, the, the simple fact that you then find yourself in one of two situations. The first one would be that you assume that God created good and evil, right and wrong, out of his pleasure. And so you could not proceed to argue that God is good because he created it. Uh, and then, in the other hand, on the other hand, you can find yourself in a different situation, which is, no, God did not create right and wrong, so there are things that precede God. So God is not absolute, and you have no reason to continue using the idea of God as an intermediary. You can just say that there are right, there's right and there's wrong, there's good, there's evil, and we, we came to know these things. God is an intermediary. Yeah, but these things, does not, these things do not come from God. So this is a very strong argument by Russell. And he even talks about the ancient Gnostics here. You could, of course, if you like, to say that there was a superior deity who gave orders to the God and made this world, or could take up the line that some of the Gnostics took up a line which I often thought was a very plausible one, that, as a matter of fact, this world that we know was made by the devil at a moment when God was not looking. There is a good deal to be said for that, and I am not concerned to refute it. So the ancient Gnostics were considered erratics because they, they did believe that the, the God that you, you find in the Bible is a god that is actually evil. It's called Yaldabaoth. And the, the real god, the good, omni, omnipotent god, was far distant and, and not concerned by this small prison that Yaldabaoth created with these human creatures. And so, uh, although sometimes he sends some help to, 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 to resolve the problem, and Jesus Christ, according to the Gnostics, would be uh, this kind of help. But it's not the orthodox reason of the, of the text. Like the serpent, for example, in Eden would be an ally. The knowledge, gnos, gnos in Greek means knowledge. And so the Gnostics, they will interpret the serpent from the tree of the, the knowledge of good and evil as an ally and not an enemy. It's very interesting. Uh, but, of course, Russell doesn't believe it. I don't believe it myself, of course. And this is just uh, an interesting perspective because an argument could be made in favor of the Gnostics by looking at the world we find ourselves in, which is full of injustice, which is full of evil and murder and chaos. And you can argue, uh, argue as Augustine did, uh, saying that uh, evil does not have a substance, evil is an accident, the, the, ex the essence is a good essence, and evil is basically just corruption. You could invert the argument and say to the, to the theologian the, the following thing. What if evil is the essence and, and, and good is actually the, the accidents, the, the corruption? Because when you look at this world, you find that it tends to corruption in, in, many, in many real ways. And many people suffer a lot. And so uh, you could make the, the inverse argument uh, of the... You could invert uh, Augustine's argument. So moving on, he, he, he talks about remedying of injustice, where he questions the fallacy that the belief in God is necessary uh, for a person's life, for society's stability. Uh, and he says that many people believe in God and follow uh, religious dogmas because they were told to do so, basically from birth. And uh, it could be different. It did not have to be this way. And people are not moral just because they believe in God. On the contrary, he finds that many of the Christians, like say the, the Ku Klux Klan, 
are everything but moral. Of course, there are many Christians that are moral people and there are good people. And we are not talking about these people here, but we are talking about the fundamentalists, the, the racists and everyone that hides behind the mask of religion. So we've talked about God and the belief in justice, immortality, and now he goes on to talk about the character of Christ, which he does not think is the most virtuous or the most wise of all, as uh, people argue. He thinks, for, exa for example, that Socrates or Buddha or Lao Tzu could be superior to him in, in these respects. However, he does agree with many of Christ's te teachings and he grants Christ uh, a very high level of moral integrity. So he says, I am concerned with Christ as he appears in the Gospels. Taking the Gospel narrative as it stands, and there on one does find some things that do not seem to be very wise. For one thing, he certainly thought that his second coming would occur in clouds of glory before the death of all the people who were living at the time. There are a great many texts that prove that. That prove that. He says, for instance, Ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Then he says, There are some standing here which shall not taste death till the Son of Man comes into his kingdom. And there are lots of places where it is quite clear that he believed that his second coming would happen during the lifetime of many then living. That was the belief of his earlier followers, and it was the basis of a good deal of his moral teachings. When he said, take no thought for the moral, and things of that sort, it was very largely because he thought that the second coming was going to be very soon, and that all ordinary mundane affairs did not count. I have, as a matter of fact, none, none some Christians who did believe that the second coming was imminent. I knew a parson who frightened his congregation terribly by telling them that the second coming was very imminent indeed, but they were much consoled when they found that he was planting trees in his garden. The early Christians did really believe it, and they did abstain from such things as planting trees in their gardens, because they did accept from Christ the belief that the second coming was imminent. In that respect, clearly he was not so wise as some other people have been, and he was certainly not superlatively wise. Now this is one of the most interesting parts, where he talks about defects in Christ's moral teachings. There is one very serious defect to my mind in Christ's moral character, and that is that he believed in hell. I do not myself feel that any person who is really profoundly humane can believe in everlasting punishment. Christ certainly, as depicted in the Gospels, did believe in everlasting punishment. And one does not find repeatedly a vindictive fury against those people who would not listen to his preaching. And one does find repeatedly an attitude which is not uncommon with preachers, but which does somewhat detract from superlative excellence. You do not, for instance, find that attitude in Socrates. You find him quite bland and urbane toward the people who would, who would not listen to him. And it is, to my mind, far more worthy of a sage to take that line than to take the line of indignation. I really do not think that a person with a proper degree of kindliness in his nature would have put fears and terrors of that sort into the world. Then Christ says, The Son of Man shall send forth his, his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and then which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And he goes on 
about the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. It comes in one verse after another, and it is quite manifest to the reader that there is a certain pleasure in contemplating wailing and gnashing of teeth, or else it would not occur so often. Then you all, of course, remember about the sheep and the goats. How, at the second coming, he is going to divide the sheep from the goats, and he is going to say to the goats, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire. I believe I need to say no more. Then he talks about the emotional factor that leads people into believing in a certain religious dogma. There is a need for a, a consolation, for a, a superior brother, a father figure, and a, a, a need for, to feel more comfortable in life and to have security of an afterlife. It's somewhat similar to other critiques, as we, we find in Freud, for example. And uh, he talks about that religion is based on fear. And it's very nocive, very damaging to society. He says, It is partly the terror of the unknown and partly, as I have said, the wish to feel that you have a kind of elder brother who will stand by you in all your troubles and disputes. So just to offer you an example, as an atheist myself, I agree pretty much with Russell's critique and his point of view. And I will give you a story which happened to someone who was close to my family, who ended up to uh, have cancer. And the way this person dealt with the disease was the way of avoiding treatment because the person believed that she was already being cured by God. And to accept a treatment would mean some sort of disrespect, if not sin, against God, who was superior and who was already supposedly taking care of her. So this could be very harmful and, and very serious to individuals and society. And it could have a direct impact in people's welfare and, people, and people's health. So, yeah, this is just an example. So moving on, Russell finishes the lecture with a short segment called What We Must Do, which is a very inspiring one, which I'll read right now. We want to stand upon our own feet and look fair and square at the world. Its good facts, its bad facts, its beauties, and its ugliness. See the world as it is and be not afraid of it. Conquer the world by intelligence and not merely by being slavish, slavishly subdued by the terror that comes from it. The whole conception of God is a conception derived from the ancient oriental despotisms. It is a conception quite unworthy of free men. When you hear people in church debasing themselves and saying that they are miserable sinners and all the rest of it, it seems contemptible and not worthy of self-respecting human beings. We ought to stand up and look the world frankly in the face. We ought to make the best we can of the world. And if it is not so good as we wish, after all it will still be better than what these others have made of it in all these ages. A good world needs knowledge, kindliness and courage. It does not need a regretful hankering after the past or a fettering of the free intelligence by the words uttered long ago by ignorant men. It needs a fearless outlook and a free intelligence. It needs hope for the future, not looking back all the time toward the past that is dead, which we trust will be far suppressed by the future that our intelligence can create. I hope you liked the video. I hope you comment here your views and opinions on Russell's philosophy and this text in particular, your views of Christianity, if you agree, if you disagree. Please subscribe to support the channel 
and if you happen to know some Portuguese, you can also find the link to my original and much bigger channel from Brazil in the description and in the channel. Thank you so much. I see you next time.